first Sunday of Advent. This is the beginning of the new church year. Most people look to January 1st, but not for the church. It begins with the season of Advent. This is a beginning point for us to begin anew as we enter in and prepare ourselves for the, for the coming of the Christ child. I do want to add my welcome to the one offered by Sheila, remind you about those blue cards, of course, bringing them forward later unless you're thinking about joining, and then we say keep a hold of it, and you can give it to one of the elders, you can give it to me at the close of the service. In your worship guides this morning, there was a sheet about the poinsettias. We always like to decorate the sanctuary as we come to the end of our Advent season with poinsettias, and if you would like to purchase one in honor or memory of someone, I invite you to do that this morning. Uh, we have a couple of concerts coming up, December 4th, December 11th. December 4th, our traditional choir and orchestra will be offering a wonderful concert here in this space. A week later on December 11th, our contemporary band and choir will be doing a concert. They're both wonderful events that I think help make us ready. We need to be intentional about this time and not just allow it to get, you know, go by and we wake up on Christmas morning and think to ourselves, what did I do? What did I miss? So be intentional. Set aside some time. Come to those concerts. Also want to lift up that on December 11th, that Sunday morning is our annual congregational meeting. We'll be offering blessing to our leadership for 2017, but also giving blessing to our budget for 2017. That is a quick reminder. If you haven't turned in those pledge cards, please, please do that this morning. You can find them out at our, our Welcome Center. And finally, also on December 11th, our Wednesday CAT program. CAT stands for Christian Arts and Theater. It's this wonderful program we started this fall. Our children have been preparing a program to put on for the congregation. And on that afternoon at 1.30, they'll be doing behind the scenes the birth of Jesus, and that will be over across the way. And I hope that you will come and support the children's program. Again, that's December 11th at 1.30. A lot going on. Today, as we still have the words that John shared earlier from the beginning of Luke's gospel, the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, I want to turn to some words from the Apostle Paul that we find in his letter to the church at Rome. In the 13th chapter, it says this, as you are doing all of this, you know what time it is. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your sleep. Now our salvation is nearer than when we first had faith. The night is almost over and the day is near. So let's get rid of the actions that belong to the darkness and put on the tools of light and put on the tools of light. May those be words that we not only hear this morning, but be words that we share to ourselves throughout this coming week of putting on the tools of light. Join me in prayer. Continue to provide for us those tools of light in a world that can be so dark and cold. Provide us, gracious God, your gift of light that comes anew into the world during this marvelous Advent season. Amen. This is Hope Sunday, the first Sunday of our Advent experience. And yes, this morning we will speak about hope. We will pray about hope. We will hear songs about hope. But one hour of hope is not enough to combat the negativity that breeds hopelessness that's out there the other six days and 23 hours every week. Not to be pessimistic, but negativity is more contagious than hope. And our society, I think, has gotten a little addicted to negativity. Negative thoughts, negative energy, 
negative opinions. People pretend that they can observe it objectively, keeping it all at an arm's length. But negativity is, in fact, much more contagious and consuming than we give it credit. You may know a person. You may be the person. Whatever the case, too many people, I, I, at least I believe, don't realize how affected and infected negativity is in their lives. How many negative thoughts and experiences that spur hopelessness have attached themselves to people. And I am deeply concerned that in our society, there remains too many people who are unaware of the power of hopelessness. And all of that begins to cloud a person's vision. Now, I'm I'm pretty certain that people who feel hopeless are still able to kind of go on with life. Many of them are still productive people in society, but it's there, and it's weighing, and it's troubling. And we all know at least one person who knew that darkness and hopelessness. We may not know him, know him personally, he's a fictional character. But his name is Ebenezer Scrooge. And during this Advent season, every Sunday, we are going to watch a little segment of A Christmas Carol. And so I invite you to now watch some of the introduction of that show, that movie. Seven years ago today. What's that, you say? Mr. Marley died. Seven years ago, this very day. Would it be too much to ask that you return to the work in which I pay you so handsomely? Merry Christmas, Bob Cutter. And the same to you, Mr. Gray. Merry Christmas, Uncle. I said Merry Christmas, Uncle. <laughs> humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle. Surely you don't mean that. I do. What's Christmas? But a time for buying things for which you have no need, no money. <laughs> time for finding yourself a year older, not an hour richer. <laughs> if I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips <laughs> should be boiled in his own pudding <laughs> and buried with a steak of holly through his heart. Come now. Mario, you keep Christmas in your way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then. Much good it may do you. Much good it has done you. There are a great many things from which I might have derived good, from which I have not profited, I dare say. Christmas among the rest. But I've always thought of Christmas time when it comes round as a good time, a kindly, forgiving, charitable time. A time when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely to their fellow creatures. And so Uncle Bert has never put a scrap of gold or silver into my pocket. I do believe that it has done me good. And I say, God bless it. Not a sound from you. And you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. Quite a powerful speaker, sir. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Please don't be angry, Uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Dine? <laughs> I see myself in hell for it. It will be a great joy to me. And to my wife. Yes, your wife. I'm told she brought very little to the marriage. A poor girl, I said. I love her. And she loves me. Love. Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can't we be friends? You are wasting my time. I'm sorry to find you so resolute. You've never had a quarrel so far as I know. 
and so I shall keep my good humor and wish you a Merry Christmas. Goodbye. And a Happy New Year. How's that fine family of yours, Lord Crescent? Well, sir, all very well. Good, you'll give them my best wishes. Yes, sir, I shall. Thank you for remembering. Goodbye, Crescent. Goodbye, sir. And a Merry Christmas. is, in my opinion, the iconic story of this season. And the name Ebenezer Scrooge is, is more than just a name. The name Ebenezer is the antithesis of Christmas. To be a Scrooge is to be the inverse of everything we believe is important at this time of the year. And from his lips, the humbug is not just a, a dismissal, dismissive way of, of responding to what someone has said. I believe the word humbug is in fact a smokescreen, trying to hide that sense of hopelessness that has come upon one's life. In the opening of Luke's telling of the Christmas story, we read about Zechariah and Elizabeth. But there's a phrase right at the beginning that says, during the rule of King Herod of Judea. Those words might not seem all that significant to us. Putting it in historical context, maybe. But to the original listeners of that story, that would have been a sucker punch to the gut. For Herod, Herod represented Roman occupation. Herod represented a lack of freedom. He represented fear and intimidation, and he was the source of darkness and hopelessness for the people. And so this story begins among the hopeless for the sake of the hopeless. Prepare the way for the Lord, the scripture says. Make ready the path for the Lord. And Zechariah and Elizabeth and their soon to be born son, John, John the Baptist, they do just that. They prepare the way for the Lord, for the coming of a child, for the one that will be called Christ the King, the gift of hope for the world. In Romans, the Apostle Paul offers wonderful words about people awakening, awakening to the gift of salvation, the gift of God that is coming into the world. It is Paul's way of describing a birth story, if you will, a rebirth of God's saving act, a reminder that God didn't just come once. But God comes again and again into our lives. God finds a way of entering in the lives of those who are feeling lost and hopeless. The night is almost over, Paul writes, and the day is near. So let's get rid of the actions that belong to the darkness, he writes, and put on the tools of light. Today, I want to talk about the tools of light, a gift, a gift to those who find themselves in the darkness, who find themselves in that sense of hopelessness like, like an Ebenezer. The first apartment that I rented after graduate school first one that I'd be staying in alone, no roommates, wonderful. I moved in in the afternoon, got unpacked. I didn't have much at that time. I went out to the grocery store, got some items, put them in my refrigerator. I started making some dinner that evening. And then I carried my meal out into the living room, dining room, where I had a little round table and two chairs, and I put my meal down on it. I started to sit down and realize, you know, the sun was setting, the room was dark, so I went over to the light switch and flipped it on. No light. Flipped on the other light switch. No light. I turned around and the ceiling fan was beginning to spin. But the ceiling fan 
had no lights. It was just a ceiling fan. And come to find out, in that first apartment, there was a light in the kitchen, there was a light in the bathroom, there was a light in the bedroom closet, but there were no other lights in the apartment, not in the living room, dining room, and not in the bedroom. And, and I needed light. And if you didn't know, there's tools of light. They're called lamps. And the next morning, I had to go out and purchase a couple of them and plug them in. Light is important when you find yourself in darkness. Now, none of us are probably quite like Ebenezer, but there is darkness, a darkness that brings on hopelessness in many people's lives. And they need the tools of light, and yet too many of them respond with a humbug, which sounds dismissive, but is more of just a smokescreen, a smokescreen that they are hiding behind. And so we need to go head to head with that humbug, trying to bring through the tools of light a sense of hope to those that cannot imagine hope. But first, First, we need to know that there is a pattern to hopelessness, an event, an experience. It occurs, and it brings darkness into our lives. And when there is darkness, there is a feeling that one has of being alone and disconnected from the world. And so when one is in the darkness and they are feeling alone, they begin to feel a growing sense of powerlessness. And as all of that occurs, we begin to create a skewed understanding of the world. Suddenly, it's very black and white. I will never get that. That will never happen to me. No one will ever love me. No one. We talk in extremes, and that becomes our worldview, and we find ourselves trapped in it, and it begins to cast an even greater shadow over our lives, which causes even more darkness which then leads to more disconnection. And all of a sudden, what was a pattern is now a cycle. And we begin to go deeper and deeper into the darkness and into that sense of hopelessness. The cycle needs to be broken. I was reading on the website for the University of Tennessee, and, and over to the left, there was a, a link. It said, how do I get my hope back? Well, I was intrigued by that, and so I clicked on the link. Well, come to find out, at the University of Tennessee, there is a scholarship called the Hope Scholarship, and that link was for students whose GPA had dropped below the required GPA level to keep that scholarship, and it was a, an appeals process a form that one had to fill out, though it said, please wait 30 days for the response. Oh, how I wish it were that easy when I lost hope, that all it took was clicking on a link, filling out a form, and waiting 30 days, but it's not that easy. And yet, let me say that there is one who does allow us to re-experience hope. The story of Advent is ultimately a story about relationship. It is about our God being Emmanuel, which means God with us. It is describing a God that does not stay at a distance, but chooses to enter in, not only into our lives, but to enter into our darkness. And yet, the reaction of those who are feeling hopeless is to push other people away and to push God away, to use words like humbug, I'm not interested, who cares? And yet that pushes away what it is that we really need in those moments. That's the reason Paul suggests that though salvation is coming near, we need to get rid of the things of darkness and to put on the tools of light. Paul wants his people, his congregation, to prepare themselves. They are not the light, 
but they can be a reflection of the light. They can share that light that they have experienced. And this morning, I want to offer six simple, and let me add, random ideas that may not speak to you, but I hope they might spur your imagination. But things that we can do. The first thing is we need to help people get out of their heads. When you are feeling hopeless and you have disconnected yourself from other people, you start having conversations, but you have conversations with yourself. And that begins to just spin over and over the negativity and the sense of hopelessness. We need to help get people out of their head and get them into hand-holding. Community is not something that is done up here, it's done here. It is done when we reach out and touch the hand of someone else. It's where we reach out and hug another human being. Second, don't wait for people to exit out of their darkness. Look to God who chose to enter the darkness with the tools of light to be the light. We need to help pull back the curtains. I love the story of the woman whose neighbor was going through a period of darkness. Her spouse had died. And so this woman every morning made breakfast and took it over to her neighbor's home. After placing the meal upon the table, the next thing she would do every morning was to go to the curtains and open them to let the light in. She knew otherwise her neighbor would remain in the dark all day long. We need to enter the darkness and help bring some light. The third thing is to invite others to take a Sabbath, a sabbatical, a break from social media and the news. Because if there's anything out there that reinforces the negativity that drives us into the darkness, that drives us into a spirit of hopelessness, it is social media and the news. So let me suggest this morning we try something radical and we actually socialize and we make news that is worth telling. Number four. As I talked about those words, about being tools of light and remembering those words, there is something important about memorizing portions of Scripture and repeating them to ourselves. A friend of mine, his son was going through a very difficult time. And so every morning and at every day at noontime and every evening, he would email his son just one passage of Scripture. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness could not extinguish the light. Every day, three times a day, he got that passage of Scripture, and he read it out loud. He said that for weeks he read it out loud but did not believe it. But there was something about saying it over and over and over again. And he came to believe that, yes, the light comes into the darkness, and the darkness cannot extinguish the light. The fifth thing, if you know someone who's in the dark, who's feeling hopeless, invite them to take a walk, a walk through the neighborhood, a walk in the park. It sounds simple, but there's something about walking alongside another person and having a conversation with that person and greeting other human beings along the way that begins to awaken a person to the, to the community that is around them. And finally, Coming out of our congregational conversations, I talked about the importance of us being in worship at least 75% of the Sundays every year. I know some people work every other Sunday, so that's not a possibility, but 75%, maybe 80% of the Sundays, we can be in worship. We need to be in worship, not just for ourselves, but you might have the tools of light that are needed for that person that comes into worship and sits down next to you. You might have that gift that will bring light to that person's darkness. You might be the spark that person needs in, that, in their sense of hopelessness. We need to go head to head with humbug. We need to not allow that dismissive word to just have us turn away and walk. We need to enter that darkness and 
and to be the reflection of light for sisters and brothers. Maurice, Maurice was overwhelmed. He was feeling helpless and hopeless. It was the second semester of his sophomore year in college. He was a thousand miles away from his home. He was working two part-time jobs. He had overloaded his classes that semester, and everything seemed to be falling apart. He felt utterly hopeless. He would call his mom, and his mother would say the same thing. You should just go to church. And he would say the same thing. Mom, I don't have time to go to church. I need those hours just to study. And by the way, there's nothing for me there, and there's no one who will care for me if I go there. And week after week, that was the conversation. And then one Sunday morning, and Maurice said, I have no idea why. I got up and I went to church. And he said, for the first time during a three-minute prayer, I felt peace in my life. It didn't stay, but at least for a few moments, I felt peace. And then after worship, I was talking to some people, Maurice wrote, and a couple, an older couple came up to him. And they were talking to him and they said, would you like to go out to lunch? And his first reaction was to say, I don't have the time. I need to get home. I need to study. I have have work later this afternoon. But then he thought to himself, somebody else paying for a good meal or going home and having ramen noodles. I'll take them up on the offer. And as they sat at the table, they asked questions of Maurice. And he began to tell them about everything that was going on in his life. And he said there was something about putting it out there, putting it on the table, no longer just keeping it inside and swirling it around, but putting it out there for everyone else to see. He said, It didn't solve my problems, but I realized, he wrote, that they were not the monsters I had made them out to be. There are Maurice's all around us. You might even feel this day like you are a Maurice, a person that is feeling overwhelmed, in the dark, feeling hopeless. And the reaction might be humbug. Let none of us hear that as our exit music. Let us hear that really as an invitation to enter the darkness, to walk alongside someone else, to bring with us the tools of light that we have received in the gift of the Christ child and allow that light to shine in their darkness. It's not going to solve their problems overnight, but there is something about being in community. There is something about being in relationship with one another that is so important in life. And when hopelessness comes, what do people do? They push others away. They push God away. And they go deeper into the darkness, deeper into the hopelessness. And somewhere the cycle needs to be broken. And God has called upon you and me to be the ones who enter that darkness, who come alongside others, and to say to them, the light does shine. A gift is coming into the world, and that gift is God's hope for all of us. It is our calling. It is our task. And God has given us the power to do it. For God is the light, and the light is breaking into the world. And each of us has been given tools to reflect that light into the lives of sisters and brothers. This morning, we are preparing to light the first Advent candle. Each week during Advent, we will do that. There are four on the outer ring, and they stand for the four Sundays of Advent. Hope, peace, joy, and love. The center is a white candle. It is the Christ candle. We will light it on Christmas Eve. This morning, we will light the candle of hope. And it will be a wonderful way to begin this time. It is a simple act, and yet I believe it is one of the most powerful acts, for we see in just a moment a little bit of light entering into our lives. I invite you to join now as we sing the first verse of One Candle is Lit.
beginning, there was no earth or sky, only darkness. Yet God existed. And where there is God, there, there is, is hope. hope. When nothing seems possible, and the darkness, darkness is, is all, all around, around us, remember that God exists. And, and where, where there, there is, is God, God, there is hope. Let, Let the, the light, light of hope shine. shine. Join me in prayer. We have started. We have started the work of making ourselves ready for you, O oh Lord. A time to prepare for transformation, to make ourselves ready for a real and lasting change that comes not, not from our own doing, but from you, the one who is the light of the world. It is a wonderful season of the year, yet too often we find ourselves being consumed by negativity, a negative thought, a negative experience that comes our way, and that negativity begins to breed a sense of darkness all around us. And this darkness disconnects us from others, from you. In our time of need, we tend to push away the very things we need for healing and for hope. Let the news of this Advent season, the amazing news of your Advent, your coming, your willingness to step into the darkness, may that news bring with it the tools of light that shall help return hope not only to our lives, but to a world that knows way too much darkness. We offer these words of prayer in the name of the Christ child whose birth we will soon celebrate.